from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Hi, folks. Cesar here. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a pretty serious show this evening. In the news, you've probably heard Governor McAuliffe here in Virginia is pushing forward some gun safety measures. And uh, there's been a big firestorm surrounding that. Uh, he promised it uh, in the election and he's delivering. Tonight I have a bunch of people, uh, a good panel, uh, but first I wanted to bring on uh, someone that's very much familiar with this issue, uh, Lizette Johnson. She is an intimate partner murder survivor. And after spending about 21 years in a very abusive marriage, um, she was threatened several times of being killed herself. She uh, attempted to leave the marriage several times. Uh, she finally exited the marriage safely in uh, October of 2009. And despite some assurances of her husband that uh, all the firearms had been removed from the premises, um, he shot her several times with a gun that he had hidden uh, before taking his own life. Uh, you should know their nine and 12 year old children were also in the home at the time. Uh, she now serves as a, a peer advocate um, in the Injury and Violence Prevention Program at VCU Medical Center. And she's here to talk about her experiences and why this is such an important issue. Lizette, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. You drove up from Richmond. This is pretty important for you. It's very important. Yeah. Give us a little bit of background on, on why you are so passionate about this beyond the obvious. Uh, you know, I think that everyone deserves to be respected, mm -hmm. to have a relationship that is mutually fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And there are so many people we don't even know about that are actually trapped. They're, they're like prisoners of war in their own home. And I'm especially passionate about children because my children did witness this. Mm -hmm. I've seen the last five years of what they've had to go through. I, my, my concern when I was leaving was to give them a better, healthier relationship model than mm -hmm. what their father and I had together. Mm -hmm. But after he shot me and shot himself, they, they've been beyond traumatized. Mm -hmm. And what they've had to go through will affect them their whole lives. And my question initially was, who will they be in five years or 10 years? Sure. And now my passion is, who Will these children who are living in violent homes be in five or 10 or 15 years? And they're gonna be taking care of you and me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they'll, they'll be the, the leading members of our society. We hope that they will be. But they're also gonna be carrying around tremendous trauma from witnessing the ty these types of events. Now, we talked earlier, this, this isn't limited to one segment in our society, correct? No. I, I, for me, uh, I think perhaps abuse happens differently in, in different segments, different mm -hmm. educational um, segments, different socioeconomic segments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was a business owner. Right. I had nine employees. I couldn't, uh, even if I had wanted to seek shelter, uh, he knew where to come find me at my office. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell my nine employees I'm going to live at a shelter. I mm -hmm. couldn't shut my business down. Mm -hmm. And he was a very well-respected uh, member of the community. People thought very highly of him. They had no idea what was going on behind closed doors. So that's a little different picture than what I think most of us would have of someone, a woman, uh, in an abusive relationship. It spans, it, it spans race, it spans uh, sexual orientation, it, it spans education, economics, it, it is a non-discriminatory, it, it hits everyone. When you went for help, when you reached out, what was that like? It, it was difficult for me because it was mostly a verbally abusive relationship. He was very cunning that way. He didn't mm -hmm. want to have marks where uh, people that he worked with and, and people that he associated with socially would, would be able to identify him as a domestic abuser. So he was verbally abusive and I, I wasn't able to seek a protective order because it was simply my word against his. He was, he was very credible. 
I just wanted to exit to give my children some peace, uh, to, to give them the chance at a healthy uh, adult uh, life by, by taking that element out, I, I hoped. Mm -hmm. I hoped that it would minimize it. Obviously, the, the end result is that it, it, you know, it didn't, but I feel like it, it was, uh, this, the services that were available, mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't, I, I wasn't aware of them. And that's mm -hmm. another thing that really drives me. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't aware that I could access a hotline or mm -hmm. that I could make a safety plan. I had mm -hmm. no idea what a safety plan was because I didn't self-identify as a domestic violence sure. victim. Well, it's a, it's a bit of a, it's hard to admit that you're in something that's pretty abusive or, or you failed at something. I did. Right. I, my parents were married 47 years yeah. and that's exactly, I yeah. felt like I was failing at right. my marriage. Right. I wasn't doing something right. Mm -hmm. I should have been married a lifetime because mm -hmm. yeah. that's what I saw as my model. Mm -hmm. Or you internalize it and you must fix it because therefore right. Right, you, you would be successful at that. Right. Exactly. What, tell me a little bit about what has changed since you reached out versus where we are today. I mean, can you do? Much. Okay. Uh, for instance, the protective orders, even five years ago, mm -hmm. it was just on the cusp of changes in protective orders. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the funding has stepped up domestic violence Good. programs Good. so that there are more prevention programs mm -hmm. available, mm -hmm. especially on a middle school and high school level, mm -hmm. so uh, young adults are aware of what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I feel like there is, there, was, there is more proactive support available for making a safety plan so you're just not walking out the door mm -hmm. so you know how to stay safe once you leave. Because I mean, that is really the most dangerous time. So at a high, uh, yeah, perfect, uh, at a high level, someone watching out there, mm -hmm. what do they need to do? What, what's the safety plan consist of? I mean, how, how can they start to not just think about, but perhaps act on? I am a very big advocate because now that I, I volunteer um, with uh, an organization in Henrico County to meet uh, uh, victims at the ER, my goal is to not have them get to the ER. Mm -hmm. My goal is to have them access a hotline or call into a domestic violence agency, say, this is what's going on with me. I don't know what to do. Could you help me? Mm -hmm. And the services that are available, court, uh, you know, a court accompaniment, helping with protective orders, sitting down and saying, okay, where can you go? Having your children, my children weren't aware that if something happens, you know, if daddy gets violent, you run to the neighbors. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand what would have kept them safe and ultimately, I, I'd like to say that it's it's you know between a woman and a man or 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 two intimate partners. The children mm -hmm. are so often. I by the grace of God, my children were spared mm -hmm. by the grace of God only. Oh. That we're talking about children. We're talking about parents who maybe are visiting. We're talking about relatives who maybe she goes to stay with a relative and then the whole family's taken out. Mm -hmm. We we have you know policemen are very uh, are very vulnerable as well when mm -hmm. they're responding to a call. So the domestic violence agency, local uh, DV agency can can they have free counseling available mm -hmm. to work through some of these things, mm -hmm. and to I I feel like to um, reframe to help someone see sort of the dynamics mm -hmm. when you're in it. It's, it's very difficult to see a way out. Is there, is there, is there training or some sort of uh, informational? I mean, because not just the individual that's in the abusive, it's the support structure, it's right. family, friends. I mean, right. what, what can those people look for if they suspect or think? Because I, I have 51 first cousins. We, we know <laughs> all of our stuff. I mean, and, and so I'm thinking that there's probably members of family or friends that suspect but may not know how to approach. And I think, you know, I think just being a friend, relative friend, and, and instead of trying to get them to do something, because most are, are so caught up in it, they, they, right. they just need somebody to say, you know, 
I'm concerned about you. I've mm -hmm. noticed some things. And if you want to talk, I'm here. Mm -hmm. And if you're not comfortable with that, you know, there are some domestic violence, ag violence agencies that you can call anonymously, and they're not going to make you do anything. Mm -hmm. And just put it out there. You're planting seed, and it will be when the time is right, nurtured. And, and there's such a lack of control in these mm -hmm. type of relationships that for someone to come in and say, you need to do this, do this, do that, it just feels like someone else telling them what to do. Mm. And I think once uh, everyone gets to a point when they've just had it, and then just, and I did, I was so fortunate to have friends who mm -hmm. watched this evolve and who stood by me and when the time was right said, you know, I am concerned, my best friend, the week before he shot me said, I'm concerned that he hasn't gotten all the guns out of the house. Have you checked? Mm -hmm. Famous last words. I said, I trust him. We've been mm -hmm. married 21 years. I mm -hmm. trust him. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it was a matter of trust. I think at that point he'd already made the decision. He was ready to roll with it. And I may or may not have found the gun if, if I had looked. But she was there for me waiting mm. and never telling me, you've got to leave him. This is what you've got to do. Because leaving is a very precarious time mm -hmm. for everyone involved. So leaving may not be the answer right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, to help, there's, there's nothing, if as a supporting role, they can also call a domestic violence agency. And it's certainly enough information on the internet. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm personally, uh, there are some danger assessments, and I think it's worthwhile for someone who's in the supporting role if they, if they go through the danger assessment and are able to answer the questions for that person on behalf of that person, that they can go to them and say, look, I've looked at this danger assessment and I'm very concerned for mm -hmm. your safety and your children's mm -hmm. safety. Is there something that also educates the support individual on what the abusers sort of capacity or, or frame of mind might be? Because that, that is a very precarious situation. I, I am a, actually also a peer advocate mm -hmm. at, at VCU Medical Center's Injury and Violence Prevention Program, and I do, um, when I'm working with someone in the ER in that capacity, I do help them understand where it's coming from, what his next move is probably going to be. It's very predictable. Well. Folks, as I said, uh, this is a very serious, serious uh, topic. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. We're going to continue with this topic and discussion. We've got some other guests coming up. We'll be hearing more from the set uh, in the future. We'll be right back.